Can you hear me, Charmaine? Hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> okay, great. Um, all right, so I, I don't know if you heard like my presentation, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, I, uh, I just, you know, introduce your, your talk and, and, uh, and the context of this, of this event. Um, and um, unless you have any question and everything is clear, I just leave the, the floor to you uh, and invite the audience to join me in, in welcoming Charmaine Chua. Thank you. Okay, great. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? I guess I can't really hear you, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, if I could just have the screen that I'm wa watching turn onto the PowerPoint, that would be helpful. No, towards the PowerPoint itself? I'm looking at the audience now. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there. Um, I tried very hard to get my passport back from the embassy, but... Um, uh, did not manage to. So my regrets and uh, wish I could be there. Um, so I'm going to present work today from my um, ongoing book manuscript, which is an ethnography of the rise of logistics and the ways in which it produces domination and containment over the trans-Pacific supply chain. So today, specifically in line with Goldsmith's seminar on logistical nightmares, I'm, I'm going to think through one particular nightmare, the megaship, and the implications of monstrous infrastructural growth on the, in the logistics industry. So in the past three years, the world's largest shipping companies have been locked in a battle for the title of world's largest ship. First came Maersk with the triple E's, ships with a maximum capacity of 18,000 TEU, that's 20 foot equivalent units, ships longer than the Empire State Building on its side. Complacently, Maersk purchased the web domain worldslargestship.com only to find less than a year later that it had been taken over by the CSCL Globe, a 19,100 TEU behemoth launched by China Shipping Container Lines in 2014. Then came the MSC Oscar at 19,224 TEU, which held the title until Maersk answered back with new 20,000 TEU ships. Finally, in 2016, OOCL ordered 621,000 TEU ships, and that for now is where things stand, with the OOCL Hong Kong claiming the title of the first ship to cross that 21,000 TEU mark when it was delivered in May of this year. May of 2017, sorry. So if the monstrous ambition of these shipping companies seems like a sort of masculinist game, a tower of Babel-like quest for mastery over the ocean, you would be right. But there is also something more at stake, which is the way in which the unmitigated expansion of logistics infrastructures produces a series of unfolding political economic crises, or logistical nightmares, which I will explore in my talk today. So here's one of those nightmares. On August 30th, 2016, without most people noticing, an unprecedented global crisis occurred at sea and out of sight. The expansion of ship sizes brought so much container capacity onto the market without enough accompanying trade growth that ships began to suffer the weight of overspeculation. Crumbling under the weight of a $5.4 billion debt, South Korea's largest shipping company and seventh largest in the world, Hanjin, filed for bankruptcy. With its assets frozen, ships across Asia, Europe, and North America found themselves stranded, turned away, or placed under arrest as creditors rushed to seize what assets they could salvage and ports refused to allow Hanjin ships to dock because of uncertainty about who would pay the bills. Now this left more than 80 massive container ships, over 3,000 sailors, half a million cargo containers, and $14 billion worth of goods from Samsung Electronics to furniture and food stranded at sea. So what you see on the screen here is a map of all of the ships that were stranded uh, for two weeks or more and, and up to four months. And as retailers struggled to figure out how to get their merchandise off these ships, 3,000 crew members across the world were stranded at sea, asked to ration their food, water, and fuel amidst uncertainty about diminishing supplies. For months, sailors were denied the basic right to walk on land, direct victims of the shipbuilding frenzy that happened just two years before. So if all of this hurried expansion of the building of megaships sounds even intuitively like an unsustainable practice, it is my aim today to show why and how um, that has become so, and in turn to interrogate the links between logistical expansion, speculations about the future of trade growth, and the effects of infrastructural expansion on human disposability. 
So the first question we can ask is, of course, the most obvious causal one. That is, why does the shipping industry seem to be shooting itself in the foot by building bigger and bigger ships? And although this is a crucial element of the story, and one which we will examine along the way, I want to ask a question that's a bit more attentive to the speculative and spatial desires implicit in chasing these big ships. So instead, I'll ask, what does the monstrous scale of infrastructural expansion tell us about global capitalism's effort to expand value accumulation? As ships grow bigger, as islands are blown up to make way for these ships, and as sailors are treated as dispensable objects stranded from unset sea, how have these obsessions with scale produced supply chains that privilege the free flow of goods and capital while simultaneously producing humans as political subjects secondary to that flow of goods? So I'll, put, I'll approach these questions from two vantage points. The first is political economic. As logistics has become a dominant mode for organizing global space, it requires the material expansion of heavy, infra sorry, heavy infrastructure that can increase the rate and volume of the total circulation of capital across the world. But this in turn creates all sorts of fixed massive expansions, making not just ships, but the entirety of capitalism's growth an endurable monstrosity. And I should say, uh, what I mean by endurable is just literally the opposite of durable. Uh, the proofreader for Sonic X was like, that's not a word. And um, there wasn't one that captured what I was getting at. So um, I'll, I'll say more a bit about what I mean by that word later. Um, now, the second vantage point is representational. Logistical nightmares remain hidden to most of us, I think precisely because it is logistics aim to keep its operations invisible, hidden away at sea and in securitized walled off ports in order to disguise the ongoing monstrosity of its operations and to atomize the collect collective solidarities that might emerge um, out of that. So what surprises me about this lack of attention to oceanic spaces is that 90% of world trade by value travels over the ocean. 90% of everything you eat, consume, or wear travels across these vast expanses of water. And yet we don't typically see ships, the ocean, logistics, or stranded sailors as integral to the making of global capitalist relations. Instead, the ocean is represented to us as somehow marginal to political life, or as Alan Sakula and Noel Birch put it, a forgotten space, empty and beyond the space of human habitation. But what becomes permissible as a result of those consumments is that states and corporations are increasingly experimenting with massively expanding the scale and scopes of logistics infrastructures without most of us noticing. So having set um, this context, I'm going to uh, make my argument in three parts today. Uh, I'm going to take a slight detour to set the historical context by looking at the rise of logistics um, and in particular the shipping container and its consequences then for this monstrous infrastructural building that I'm talking about. And then second, I'll interrogate the relationship between the durability of this infrastructure and the speculative future that they desire. And then lastly, I'll sketch just one example of how these two developments uh, are forms of durable monstrosity that carry on unseen and out of sight through um, the terraforming of the Port of Singapore. Okay, so a very short detour. What is logistics? So how many of you have bought something online in the last two weeks and did so because it was easier and faster than going to the store? No hands raised, you all buy things online, in person? <laughs> it's, okay, there we go. <laughs> Um, so the everyday normalcy with which we expect logistical systems to work smoothly and provision us with these goods as and when we need them has actually required a whole world of shifts in the global transportation system. In order to make goods arrive and move with the kind of speed that we take for granted today, even the simplest purchase requires the calibration of an astonishing cast of characters, right? So take the seeming simplicity of a new laptop speaker you might have bought on Monday, and imagine for a minute that we are entering the hidden modes of production and distribution that are required to make those speakers emerge as if without effort on your doorstep two days later. The speakers are produced in places like Shenzhen, China, where Dagon workers who leave rural villages um, work often punishing hours on assembly lines to assemble the components. And then they load them in a shipping container in the industrial development zone, along with thousands of other products, transfer them to the port of Yantian, and then your speaker makes the trip across the Indian Atlantic Oceans to arrive at the port of Rotterdam 19, uh, approximately 19 days later. Apologies that the video shows it arriving uh, in the U.S. I didn't have time to change it. Um, but so then two days later, your container is unloaded. 
Three days later, it clears customs, is transferred onto a truck, which delivers it 37 miles southwest to a distribution center. Here, the boxes are unloaded and repacked before being loaded onto one of 800 diesel trucks that pick off and drop off cargo every hour. Before your computer speaker, having traveled more than 12,000 kilometers, is delivered to your doorstep in Amsterdam. Two-day delivery, a world of logistics. Today, the rise of logistics means that commodities are manufactured across logistical space rather than in a singular place. So the, geograph the geographer Deborah Cohen has brilliantly shown that logistics remakes previously heterogeneous supply chains into a single calculative entity, uniting, uniting seemingly disparate spheres of transportation, production, and consumption through algorithmic technologies and calculations of total cost. This is a powerful transformation, right? Contemporary supply chain capitalism stretches the factory across the world, in Cohen's terms, sourcing and shipping raw materials and products across vast distances before reassembling them and shipping them out again. Um, so this is a picture that sort of depicts the way that uh, the, the world is sort of viewed in this panoptic gaze that sees all of the component parts as part of one sort of calculative regime. Now, none of this, none of this imagination of the globe as a sort of space of logistics was possible without the shipping container. Despite how common it is to see containers dotting our urban landscapes today, the shipping container did not come into international use until the 1960s. At the time, goods were transported in bulk by the banana bunch or the bolt of raw cowhide, and this was time and labor intensive. It took armies of longshore workers days, sometimes weeks, to unload a single boat. The container solved problems of efficiency by boxing everything up then into packable and stackable forms, reducing the cost of transportation from an average of US $5.83 per ton, sometimes costing almost 25% of the product, to 15.8 cents per ton. But crucially, as a single unit, the container had no value or economic potential without the infrastructural support of a vast network of trucks, cranes, and port terminals. Container infrastructure would only become viable if it could be globally extended across the oceans to distant countries where multinational corporations could profit from the cheap cost of labor in the global south. And so this is where megaships re-enter our picture, right? From the start, from the beginning point, which is this modular standardized shipping container, uh, megaships began to be seen not as ships in and of themselves, but these sort of container carrying objects. And so the larger the ship, the more containers you carry and the more efficient your, um, your economics can be. So the megaship is in the sense merely the extension of these earlier logics of efficiency at much, much larger econom uh, economies of scale. In the 50 years since the world's first container ship, Ideal X, set sail from New Jersey in 1956, Container carrying capacities have increased by 1,200%, and in the last 10 years alone, by 100%. Megaships of 18,000 TEU and above have come to dominate the shipping industry with startling rapidity. To give these ships some sense of scale, the container ship I traveled on for six weeks earlier this year was an 8,100 TEU ship. Uh, a TEU evergreen vessel. So uh, the video of me is actually blocking me, but uh, there's a pi picture of me sort of standing over the edge of this uh, container loading dock, which, which uh, sort of gives you a sense of how large these things are. But at 333 meters long, 43 meters across, and 17 meters high, the ship I was on in this picture is taller than the Arctic Triumph or Niagara Falls. It is as long as a line of 70 cars, the Eiffel Tower tipped on its side, two Roman Colosseums, four New York City blocks, or six and a half White Houses. It would require a line of 40 mile line of trucks to transport all its cargo. But when it was built in 2007, it was the largest ship in the world. That's just uh, 10 years ago. Yet today, just 10 years later, its size is unremarkable, dwarfed by ships almost three times its carrying capacity. So if you look at that chart, the 81,000 TEU vessel would be sort of right in the middle of that. So in microeconomic terms, these cost-shaving measures allow larger corporations to capture the market share of global container capacity. From the perspective of an individual firm, 
The rationale for ordering bigger and more technologically advanced and fuel efficient ships is obviously beneficial, right? The bigger the ships, the larger the proportion of the fleet that's comprised of them, the greater your ability to um, carry containers and edge out your competitors by lowering your slot costs. This is sort of basic economies of scale. But once we zoom out to the industry as a whole, we see that capitalists as a class have created an anticipated, unanticipated crisis by leapfrogging each other to build the largest ship possible. So this is um, part two, durable monstrosities. So in the last few years, companies have supplied so many vessels that hundreds of ships have come into service at the same time, making it difficult for carriers to match demand with burgeoning supply. Since the 2008 financial crisis, trade volumes haven't recovered sufficiently. And so returns on capital for these massive ships have remained quite pitiful, resulting in many empty ships traveling across the ocean while filled with far less than the projected maximum loads. This results in what the industry terms overcapacity. With ships traveling only half filled on the designated routes, the fuel and slot cost savings these ships were designed for are largely canceled out, forcing companies to drive down their freight rates. In the ideal outcome that these shipping companies picture when they build, when they build these ships, megaships would be fully loaded and constantly circulating the ocean. When ships are built, they are designed to never stop for a break. They continue tra traversing the globe's surface in 10 to 45 day rotations, reaching one end of their route and turning around almost immediately. But in the current climate, many ships are idled and kept out of service at anchor for a month and beyond because there's just not enough volume to put these ships in service and to bear the crew, fuel, and docking costs which that requires. In November 2016, the reported laid-up cellular capacity drove freight rates down to record lows. Laid-up cellular capacity simply means the amount of empty space that's in a container. So 263 container ships across the world were reported idled totaling 934,000 TEU and representing 4.7 of the total global fleet. From the standpoint of shipping industry experts, few have questioned this kind of if you build them, they will come logic that drives the mega ship frenzy. Ships are being ordered and there's no sign it's going to stop, the typical analyst report goes. So ports need to figure out how to deal with this coming onslaught. So in other words, analysts respond to these logistical problems with a technocratic respond, response based on the self-interest of particular stakeholders, rather than to probe into the cascading social, material, and political effects they bring to bear on the totality of global capitalist relations. What's interesting to me is the way in which these expressions of self-interest carry with them these um, extra economic logics of hope in unstable speculative futures. In an industry where fine-tuned cost calculations champion rationalistic, econo economistic thinking, I actually often found in interviews with shipping executives that extra or even non-economic desires played key roles in decision-making. So for instance, in, in a 2015 interview with the Maersk network designer Nils Madsen, I pressed the question of how ordering megaships relied on projections that they could be filled at 100% capacity. How do you know that your triple E ships will eventually be filled if the global economy is bad and trade volumes haven't been going up, I asked. Madsen responded, well, you don't know. You hope. There's a bit of hope in it. Of course, we try to read the economic numbers and well, the world economy seems to be growing no matter what happens. If it grows 2%, then in principle, you need to grow your fleet by 4% to grow the company. So we just keep building bigger ships. Madsen made no admission that the mad rush to build megaships could be the precise cause and exacerbation of a shipping crisis. Rather, he proudly owned the fact that Maersk has continuously set the precedent for larger ships in the industry. What you're going to see, he said, is if we order triple E's, soon everybody orders ships of the same size. We don't want other companies to leapfrog us and be more aggressive on investments. So we are going to defend our, ma our market leading position. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this talk of big ships was frequently augmented with military and sexual metaphors. It's an arms race, several shipping industry professionals have told me. Mills Matson went on, don't get me wrong, it's an arms race, but also, and maybe this sounds stupid, there is also pride in having the biggest one. And then with a wink, he said, I mean, we are men after all, right? We like to have the biggest one, always. That's how it works. 
Carol Cohen has traced in the context of military defense intellectuals that discourses of nuclear strategy frequently employ techno-strategic language that is characterized by extraordinary extraction and removal from the military realities and peppered with sexual subtext, or as she puts it, white men in ties discussing missile size. Now, the same might be said of shipping professionals, white men in ties, discussing not missile sizes, but very big ships in very deep harbors. Leaning across the table to me at a cafe conspiratorially, Madsen explained Mayor's superiority in this way. We'll always have the biggest. We are in a race to have the most impressive monster. But of course, the minute you announce you are making a new mega ship, you start a war. You are, sick. you are saying, and here he stuck his tongue out and started making a taunting noise. I have the biggest now. Yay, show me yours. Come and get me. So you started an arms race all over again. So I want to suggest that these juvenile sexual metaphors do more than just reveal the performative masculinities that are embedded in corporate culture. These, allus these allusions to phallic imagery and sexual domination are linked to speculative desires about the continued well-being of the capitalist future, marking the extra economic logics inherent in logistical fascinations with infrastructural monstrosity and scale. As David McNally notes, the monstrous is not only a dramatization of capital's soul-sucking vortex. It is also a strategic theoretical metaphor for understanding the simultaneous fear and fashion, fascination, grandiosity and uncertainty implicit in capitalism's vortex. Shortly after the 2008 financial crisis, journalist Matt Taibbi famously characterized Goldman Sachs as a great vampire squid, wrapped around the face of humanity relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. The idea that something monstrous is at work in the operations of global capitalism is thus never far from the surface today. The etymology of the monster derives from the Latin monere, to warn. Monsters, McNally argues, are warnings, not only of what may happen, but also of what is already happening. They are harbingers of the things we do not want to face, of catastrophes. The simultaneous allure and fear of monster capital becomes evident in even a cursory survey of the shipping industry's reaction to megaships. Shipping professionals who exhibit a fascination with perpetual expansions of megaship scales express a contemporary social imaginary in which monstrous ships simultaneously strike a fear, a mixture of fear and fascination between the projections and calculations that are knowable and the future which is not. As McNally argues, such imaginaries highlight the role of human creation in the process of economics, in particular, and sites more generally, and the anxiety induced by the impossibility of exercising the unknown, economic or otherwise. Thus, while vampire-like blood-sucking capital accumulation may be the primary desire at work in the shipping industry's megaship frenzy, logics of market competition often stumble over the edge of the rational, relying on categories of hope, risk, and speculation to justify often seemingly self-contradictory and irresponsible forms of economic decision-making. So if we understand the logistics industry to be monstrous in this way, simultaneously fear-inducing and yet unknowable, the building of monstrous ships represents a form of speculative building that exhibits a, set, a desire not only for market share, but for mastery and control of the entire architecture of global capitalism, at the same time that ship owners realize that they can't have that mastery and control. The arms race of megaships becomes monstrous precisely at this point where it crosses the threshold of economic exaggeration, becoming insensible to measured assessments of calculable growth on which neoclassical economic logics are built. So these instances of monstrosity reveal to me the ruse at the heart of infrastructural expansion. Rather than being technical systems for the collective provisioning of basic necessities and needs for human societies, as infrastructure's terminological predecessor public works would suggest, logistical infrastructures today are more about monumental projections of the durability of capitalism's future. In fact, the history of infrastructural development is embedded within capital's effort to increase its territory and to increase its control over territory and workers over long distances. In the latter half of the 19th century, the construction of large-scale networks of transportation gave rise to new relationships between infrastructure and speculation. The railway is a prime example of this. 
Building railway tracks that crossed the entire continent required a financial outlay too large for a single company to shoulder. So it was only by issuing uh, joint stocks that railways could obtain the long-term finance they needed, marking the rise of the joint stock company and investment as a form of bet on the future. Governments simultaneously anticipated how railways would benefit the national economy and gave land grants to rail companies that in turn sold the land to settlers, real estate companies, and other businesses to raise capital for the railroads. And in this way, infrastructural expansion, the settler state's facilitation of private interests, and speculative economies became yoked together as they mobilized scarce finance in order to exploit the opportunities for long distance control. We can think in similar terms of uh, megaship infrastructural expansion as bets on the durability of capital's future. Here I follow Timothy Mitchell in thinking through durability as a concept that connects infrastructure and speculation. For Mitchell, modern infrastructure gave birth to corporate power by containing the promise of income flows that the long-lived fixed capital of equipment and technical systems seemed to guarantee. Finance capital expanded into a future built upon the new lifespan of infrastructures, charging its flimsy paperwork of financial promise with the durability of the iron, steel, copper, and lead through which it now lived. That's the quote from Mitchell. For Mitchell, the longevity that the heavy steel and grandiose monumentalities of fixed infrastructure indicates is sold as a promise on future gain. Its apparent durability expresses an implicit faith in the continued renewal of capital's future. So you can see the megaship in this way, right? That the building of the megaship is similarly a promise on the durability of logistics continued future. Um, so if the value of infrastructural projects depends on their performance of durability and corresponding ability to obtain a revenue stream, capitalists are incentivized to build infrastructure whose purposes are not only functional or a response to collective need, but rather that facilitate a performance of faith in the future of capital of accumulation. The monstrosity of megaships and the accompanying expansion of port systems exhibit just this tendency. The mania over burgeoning super sizes and the corresponding monumentality of ports and logistical gateways are in this reading redolent of hubristic desires to produce spectacles of corporate power that in turn feed into speculative building frenzies. So part three ports. Um, I want to just really, in the last bit, sort of illustrate one way in which I think this plays out. So in fact, the growth of megaships demands this corresponding build out of mega ports, right? Demanding huge outlays of public finance to support monstrous ship bodies. Now, ports worldwide are only just beginning to understand the impact of the growing presence of megaships. Terminals that were originally built to discharge cargo from an earlier era of ship sizes are now struggling to handle ship cargo from ships that in 25, 2005 had twice, and now in 2017, five times those carrying capacities. So if you can imagine, I mean, building mega ship sizes doesn't really affect the shipping companies that much, but every time a port has to sort of raise the crane beds and create larger spaces to service these ships, um, it costs billions of dollars, right? Um, so building a mega port is a mammoth task, both financially and spatially. Channels must be dredged to make way for a deep water harbor, not only once but constantly, in order to counter the tides that are constantly depositing sand. Islands are blown up. So this is a picture of um, from the ship of the Yantian Container Terminal, and if you look at the islands beyond, as we were coming into um, the port. The captain pointed out that this kind of piece of land that you see in the foreground actually used to be one of those islands, and he had just been there four years before, and they had just been completely blown up to, um, to make this terminal. Crane heights must be raised or replaced by larger ones. Yard space in the docks must be increased to support higher volumes of containers. In the hinterland, you need highways or railroad corridors or intermodal systems to support the concentration of cargo coming into the city at any one time. You need more truck drivers. You need a more sophisticated stowage plan. And of course, you need the financial support sources to support this growth. So if you can imagine, the megaship is just sort of one nodal point, right, that unfolds into these massive requirements that sort of continue to reverberate throughout um, the, the, the entirety of the logistics infrastructure. So in this respect, I think it's important to consider how the demands of megaship expansion distribute the consequences of monstrous expansion unevenly. 
Today, port cities battle to become logistics hubs because gaining foothold as distribution gateways has become an increasingly central way that states attract foreign capital investment to their borders. States that do not have the ability to invest public and private funding into the heavy, immobile, and quickly superseded port machinery quickly lose out. And as the World Bank notes, logistics brings new access to markets. But for those whose links to the global logistics web are weak, the cost of exclusion are large and growing. And so this is interesting because the World Bank has started a logistics performance index, which it now uses um, to assess uh, development over and above GDP growth. And so for them, infrastructural capacity is actually an indication of a country's development, um, which kind of supports the kind of neoliberalization of these narratives, right? So in this way, the growth of supply chain networks has prompted states to justify the environmental costs, drain on public resources and the like as necessary developments to tap into the future of logistical accumulation. As pressure to organize state space that is made safe for logistics flows increases, dispossession becomes justified through the necessity of monstrous expansion. In this sense, infrastructures of global circulation are more than just technical apparatus for the mobilization of matter into legible human resources. They are also the physical manifestation of the state's plan for the future shape of its productive forces. So there are numerous ways in which the rise of global logistics economy has distributed growth unevenly, but for now I just want to draw out one specific example that I think kind of nicely illustrates how these renewed demands to tap into logistics produces an infrastructural politics that is indurable and centers on monstrous dispossession. The example I turn to is that of land reclamation of ter or terraformed capital in the port of Singapore, when the construction of a megaport has required massive tracts of land to be reclaimed from the sea. Singapore is a desperately land scarce nation, and for much of its history, it has been engaged in what is known as land reclamation projects in order to increase the living and working space of the land. In the 50 years since, in, since, in, since its independence, sorry, its population has more than doubled requiring the continuous construction of both public private condominiums and high-rise public housing that serves 80% of the population. But it's not just physical uh, vertical growth. Singapore has also sought to grow its horizontal land area from 581.5 square kilometers in the 1960s. Singapore is today 723.2 square kilometers. By 2033, the government plans to increase its land area by another 100 kilometers, making this island a full 30% larger than its original size. So if you look at that map, um, the white space is what Singapore originally was, the pink spaces are what, it's been, what has been reclaimed today, and the darker red spaces are what it eventually hopes to become. Now with megaships coming into the port, the Ministry of Transport has laid out a plan to move the entire port operations from three different points on the island to a large piece of land on the western corner. So that sort of edge that looks like a claw is the site of the new port. This mammoth project will require reclaiming a portion of land that is a whole 7% of the current island area and will cost $4 billion financed primarily by the Port of Singapore Authority, PSA, a private entity who uses public funds acquired indirectly from Singaporeans' compulsory savings schemes for many of its operating costs. To supply itself with reclamation material, Singapore first leveled most of its hills in the 1960s, transforming an undulating island into a largely flat surface. Then it dredged its coastal seabed. But local resources were insufficient, so Singapore began importing sand from neighboring countries. In the last 20 years, Singapore has imported a reported 517 million tons of sand, making it by far the largest importer of sand worldwide. To give this mammoth figure some context, terraforming just 0.6 miles of new ground requires 37.5 million cubic meters of sand fill. This is equivalent to 1.4 million dump trucks worth of sand, a line of trucks so long that it would snake from New York City to Los Angeles and back again. Now, most of the sand used to come from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. But as the environmental impacts of sand mining have increased, depleting marine life, impeding seaborne traffic, and erasing at least 24 Indonesian islands since 2005, all these countries have now either restricted or banned exports of sand to Singapore. Today, most of Singapore's sand fill needs are supplied by Myanmar and Cambodia. 
So let me back up with a little bit of historical context. In 1819, as Sir Stamford Raffles, the colonizer of Singapore, wrote excitedly about the discovery of Singapore's potential as an entrepot hub for the East India Company, he wrote to the secretary depicting Singapore as a fulcrum upon which empire shall thrive. Today, a gleaming white statue of Raffles stands at the landing site where he first set foot in Singapore. Raffles, with one leg planted in front of the other, arms folded and gazing into the horizon, um, has a plaque below him that reads, on this historical site, Sir Stamford Raffles first landed in Singapore on 28th January, 1819, and with genius and perception, changed the destiny of Singapore from an obscure backwater fishing village to a great seaport and modern metropolis. Now, I do not read the geological metaphor of the backwater here as coincidence. Prior to its colonization, Singapore's shores were primarily marshland and swamp, which provided fertile ground for the indigenous Orang Laut to fish for mudskippers. But the transformation of this backwater fishing village not only removed their livelihoods, but also altered the structure of the earth itself, leaching water from the mud, pulverizing indigenous ways of life, dredging particulates and wildlife from the marshes in order to lay the foundations for a port. The colonial theft command and control of Lebensrand through terraforming is thus at the very center of Singapore's story of nationhood, and thus the global trade it was to facilitate. Today, Singapore's prime minister often draws on this colonial legacy to iterate the crucial function of maritime ports to Singapore's well-being. As the port thrive, he said at the opening of the new Pasir Panjang port, so does Singapore thrive. But perhaps what is new about the modern route land reclamation project is that in transporting sand to neighboring countries, it quite literally steals territory from them. Rather than doing this through the art of warfare, through territorial occupation or settler colonialism, this theft of land is practically untraceable. Islands that have, might have once been able to map with coordinates now disappear, or rather disintegrate into fragmentary fungible particles. Sand from a disappearing island in Indonesia, practically indistinguishable from sand from a seabed off the coast of Philippines. In this sense, the national imaginary in which Singapore sustains an articulation of itself as an ever-expanding modern thriving center of trade and digital life literally requires a theft of territory, a theft of land, war by other means, war by means of terraforming. To pause over the term reclamation for a while, one might recognize that dubbing an act of terraforming as reclamation is a misnomer. In its deverbative form, reclamation suggests an act of restoration or return in which one is retrieving something that was once yours. This works as a fiction on two registers. First, it presupposes that the coastal sea itself acts as somewhat aquanellius, empty space that has no history or value, except to be turned into the property of the state with the corollary that reclamation is coextensive with, the ex with an act of dispossession from elsewhere. This naturalizes a thoroughly human process of dispossession as a form of natural right. Second, to name the process a form of reclaiming centers the spatial locus of activity on the site in which land is being created, Singapore, rather than where it's being taken away, Myanmar, Cambodia, Indonesia, etc. In reclamation, a state deserves to procure or cultivate a site of habitation or commerce. No questions are asked about the sites of extraction, which it has in turn made uninhabitable. And so this is where the uneven distribution of the logistics economy becomes especially evident. Because the heavy financial burden of porch construction is placed on states to build out their infrastructure, there are different capabilities of states to expand and build hypermodern ports, depending on their access to capital. Competing ports along the Straits of Malacca, Indonesia especially, don't have the same extraordinary access to capital that Singapore does. And so as a result, peripheral ports in regions with inadequate access to transportation infrastructures are severely disadvantaged and cannot reap the benefits that a port can bring to national economies. And so resultantly, there is little access to the economic benefits of logistical mobility that these ports facilitate. In this sense, there's an extraordinary differential in access between developed and underdeveloped countries in their ability to enter the lucrative logistics trade. Building the physical infrastructure that requires such heavy investments privileges countries who only have the financial, who do not only have the financial ability to pay, but also requires that those who want to catch up 
have to bind themselves into the systems of debt and credit that development discourses demand. So what is pitched as empowerment and capital mobility by the World Bank actually ties global South countries that have resisted financialization into those very systems of debt and credit. I'm haunted perhaps most by the fact that sand is being leached from the very countries from which Singapore extracts most of its foreign labor. It is the Cambodians, Burmese, Bangladeshis, and Indonesians upon whom Singapore relies to do the construction work that builds the terraform habitats in which Singaporeans live. These are very often the people whose communities live on or around the disappearing islands and depleting marine life. In some Indonesian islands, such as Riau, fishing communities have reported that incomes have plummeted as much as 89% since the sand trade began. Experts have likewise reported extensive damage to coral reefs, exacerbating uh, coastline erosion, and the destruction of ocean environments that will take decades to be restored. There is also a morbid irony in noting how these are environmental impacts of extraction because the very anthropogenic changes caused by such forms of uh, sand mining have become part of Singapore's own justification for its land reclamation. Officials have cited sea level change as a primary motivation for raising the level of reclaimed seabeds, portraying Singapore as an entropic victim of climate change, even as the sandy bulwarks that ostensibly protect the island from such processes play a key role in exacerbating their effects elsewhere. So if you see, this is actually one of the, the kind of ball works that are used uh, between which sand is filled. And these have been raised by over, uh, I think, five meters in the last few years. So it requires just that much more sand to be mined, right, from other countries whose um, environmental effects are sort of being taken away from them. Not least, the labor hired to do the work of such infrastructural development are often precisely those who are driven from their own communities by such predatory practices of dispossession. These foreign laborers are hired on short-term, contingent, and extremely low-waged contracts to perform highly dangerous work. In this, the workers charged with increasing the value of Singapore's sovereign and commercial space by building the highways, condominiums, and business hubs that make Singapore an attractive site for foreign investment facilitate their own dispensability by constructing the very infrastructure that con contributes to the decimation of land and the dispossession of their ways of life. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip here, but I just wanted to make uh, you know, connections to places like Dubai um, and Hong Kong, where reclaimed land sort of constitutes a lucrative site of state investment, but also not only just to expand the sovereign space of operation, but they also become sites of incredible real estate speculation. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, the contradictions that follow abound. Foreign workers seldom gain access to the glimmering palaces that they help to build, except perhaps to maintain their infrastructure. They are indispensable to Singapore's workforce, but only precisely as surplus populations who can rarely hope to gain citizenship or long-term employment. Meanwhile, the price of terraformed real estate grows as states display them as markers of sovereign wealth. In this way, the exploitation of labor, the expropriation of land, and the spectacle of sovereignty and the financial of real estate all go hand in hand to create an endurable monstrosity of global capitalism. It is in the disposability of these workers' bodies that I hear echoes of the coolies who once worked as indentured labor on the shores of Singapore during the colonial era. There is a national song um, in Singapore that begins with the words, we built this nation with our hands, the toil of people from a dozen lands. Those lyrics resurface often for me when I think about the, the contemporary foreign workers who effectively serve as Singapore's fungible coolie labor today. I wonder if, had they heard that song blasting through the speakers during last year's unveiling of the port from their squalid housing quarters in the corners of Singapore, whether they would recognize themselves in those words of nation building. We built this nation with our hands. And the quite literal, material, and violent histories of global inequality, monstrous dispossession, and environmental destruction that accompanied them. So I'm going to um, just conclude really quickly here. Um, but what I hope to have done today is to think through the infrastructures of violence that accompany acts of monstrous expansion and to think about the fact that what appear to be uh, signs of durability are actually, in fact, indur indurable monstrosities. Um, if the monumental increases in the scale of hypermodern hyper -modern logistic systems are efforts to renew capital accumulation, uh, those claims on capitalist futures are ultimately and always unevenly distributed. 
But I think it's important to remember, uh, last slide, please. I think it's also important to remember that material infrastructures are not resolutely unchangeable systems. Lauren Berlant has written that infrastructure is not identical to system or structure as we currently see them, but that infrastructure is defined by the moving or patterning of social form. In other words, infrastructure is the, quote, living mediation of what organizes life, the life world of structure. If the current life worlds of monstrous infrastructure are the vampire squids that suck life from us through prisons, pipelines, megaships, and terraform dispossession, I think it's ever the more urgent that we refuse to normalize the durability of monstrous capital and ask instead how we might organize durable collective infrastructures that link us, not to capital's mendacities, but to alternative possibilities for world-sustaining relations. Or as the organizers of the blockade of the Port of Oakland in 2011 put it, the challenge is to block their world in order to unleash our own. Thank you.